Hi, welcome to the show, Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, my name is Tyler Kesk. I'm going to be your host tonight. Today on the show, we have uh, Janina Rose, who is the uh, Sacramento County Chair Chairman. We also have Chris Crockwell, who uh, formerly ran for uh, CSD. And we have Alex uh, Lee? Lee? Lay. 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 Keep, keep getting that uh, butchered. <laughs> Sorry. Who is also the uh, chapter president for uh, Young Americans for Liberty? So I also wanted to point out to attention that you guys that we do are having the uh, or that the Libertarian Party of California is having their convention uh, in April. Uh, it's going to be if you visit ca.lp.org/convention, you can get all the details there. Um, first on our agenda, agenda today, we want to talk a little about the uh, State of the Union address. Um, Alex, why don't you uh, start us off? I mean, for a State of the Union address, it seemed pretty standard to me. Okay. I mean, aside from the odd jab against the other side. <laughs> Personally, I'm just going to wait and see what Trump does. I would think talk's cheap, so... What do you think about everyone wearing white? Everyone wearing white? Yeah, the whole uh, whole thing where all the everyone with, with the uh, Democrats were wearing the... The uh, women were wearing suffrage white. It's kind of, kind of an ironic coincidence with the... Uh, People were, were saying that's correlated with, um, uh, and, I, and I, know, I know it's not not intended, but I think it's almost almost comical how it was, how it was almost related to how uh, Ku Klux Klan and everything was for, formerly associated with the Democratic Party. Well, there was a socialistic movement too that was um, that they that a lot of social media is associating that with. But if anything, I think probably just a poor choice of color. <laughs> I don't think um, it was much planning in there. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I know you were talking about something about with, uh, how Pelosi w was uh, acting kind of funny behind Trump. You want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, the, the clapping. Yeah. <laughs> well, she just she doesn't seem. Uh, you know what? They show this at every opposing State of the Union address. They uh, had pictures up of Paul Ryan mm -hmm. uh, sitting back, kind of arms crossed. You know, um, but uh, she's obviously uh, she could better compose herself. Given um, her her stating recently that she's the most powerful woman in the world uh, in the position that she is, and she does have uh, uh, you know a big stake in this fight mm -hmm. because it is uh, it's 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 not Trump versus China with tariffs anymore. It's Trump versus Pelosi now uh, to see what they can. But you know, I I really you know just with with what was said. And some people feel that in the State of the Union, he expressed that he would, you know, was trying to get folks to work together, and there will have to be concessions made. He's going to have to accept terms, um, and that's something that I don't think we've had an effective mm -hmm. um, process of, of folks re re truly reach across the aisle, an effective uh, leadership legislative process um, in a number of years. If that happens, that'll be interesting. Well, and I don't want to pretend like uh, these are Trump's words. I get that there's a speechwriter, mm -hmm. and I think they did a fantastic job. And I think that that push for unity mm -hmm. resonated with the people that actually live in the country and not just the people who dictate how we're supposed to live. <laughs> and if they don't hear that message and start acting accordingly, there's, there, they will have some uh, amount of political fallout. Aside from the crazy amount of nonverbals happening throughout that event, you know, he was saying words, but everyone was saying something with their body language and with their facial expressions and the way that they were responding, um, which was all very fascinating. But that push for unity was really clear. And it was like, he, he took his jabs right, but it wasn't like the typical Trump, oh, fake news, kind of like off the cuff. Yeah, wasn't it was really him very, talking. <laughs> it was it not. It was a so very well-crafted speech that was intended towards a certain purpose and saying things like you know what we have the opportunity to do great things and, and instead we're just fighting that's an important thing to point out and all of those things resonated with the people that were doing the polls and that were listening people like me who are like yeah that's totally true you know i'm not a trump supporter i'm not a pelosi supporter but that what he said right there that's true can you guys stop fighting and get something done because we want to have a great country <laughs> and i think most in whether republican uh democrat libertarian um, i think in in the democratic and republican parties it's a very small segment who keep these hostile arguments going mm -hmm. and and but even um you know in the state of the union one of the things i think that they did really well is um having a number of different guests at this 
uh, at the State of the Union, and they had folks who had, um, uh, there was a gentleman that uh, was a police officer, he was shot seven times in the massacre that happened in Pennsylvania at the mm -hmm. Jewish synagogue. Um, and he was there and he's going in, you know, and, uh, but there was, uh, it was interesting because today in the news, there's um, a highlight of ABC uh, was making fun of a young kid that Trump had there and basically bullying him. And Trump had him there because he's from like Jersey or something. Mm -hmm. This kid, not related to Trump, his last name's Trump. And he's being bullied Oh, yeah, school. I do you remember that. Yeah, I do remember uh, that. Article. But so, but, but, you know, so somewhere, someplace, these people have to stop these hostilities toward one another. Um, you know, I, and it is just, it, it hopefully, you know, I don't know, you, you'd think that the State of the Union would lift people up and they would maintain that thought moving forward, but we'll see what happens. I've kind of been watching to see if they're going to change the tone, and some people have changed a little bit, I think, because of the polling, but a lot of it is still the, like, just this, like, hatred towards Trump. So I don't know if it's going <laughs> to unify like it's intended to, but it will certainly leave a bad taste in people's mouths if they Yeah, and not people are going to be anti-unity because Trump said it. <laughs> right, and he even made a comment when, when the female delegation stood up because he was like, we've never had this many congresswomen and our, and they were like cheering and standing up and he's like, you weren't supposed to do that. Like, Pelosi's mad, <laughs> you know? He was kind of like building a camaraderie that they should be able to build from. My guess is that they won't because there's a different agenda, but in reality for the perception, it will look really bad if they don't try and take those positive bits mm -hmm. and create unity. Yeah, it's, all, it's almost like a, if Trump had somebody else speak speak on his behalf, even if they're from his administration, you, you'd still have more uh, support from the opposite side, I think. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of interesting. Well, uh, speaking on, on uh, really bad states, uh, what do you guys think about Hawaii's proposal to um, not necessarily ban cigarettes, but raise the uh, smoking age to an extraordinary high number? I mean, what, what is it, like 50 or 60? 100. 100. Uh, no, in 2024, in years, it'll be right? raised yeah, 2024. To to 100. What, 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 do you guys do you guys think that's a good idea, bad idea, crazy idea, or you're not really sure? What, what you... Well, you know laws always work, so of course it's going to be effective. <laughs> if you're trying to make hundred year olds like tobacco kingpins, I think this is a good way to do it. <laughs> that's it. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, you can have it, a. It was a hundred old year old lobbyist that did that, right? <laughs> you have an increase of uh, elderly flying from the mainland bringing in cigarettes. <laughs> It doesn't make sense, and oftentimes laws that don't make sense, they're not effective. So I don't think it will have the intended effect. What gave the reduction in cigarette smoking its advantages in the last, say, 10, 20 years, like we were talking about in the last segment? Um, and it's, I would say it's probably education and educating young kids first to mm -hmm. pro stop them or help get them to reduce uh, or avoid be aware of. I will counter the, that. Uh, with? I believe it was when the media and the doctors stopped promoting smoking. Well, sure. So it's not just education and, hey, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. That has a, a certain effect. Mm -hmm. well, but it, it's like we're seeing right now, we're seeing media crafted around certain topics and people are told this information. And if you're a doctor, you're in a position of authority and you're like, I smoke Marlboro's, right? Well, historically, doctors promoted, and yeah, yeah, because there's a commercial out there where they're like, um, I, I, I smoke Camel, no yeah. filters. Those are the best cigarettes for you and my body, and mm -hmm. you should smoke them. Right. But removing ads and getting them out of uh, in front of people, mm -hmm. but I still think, yeah, I don't know, with, with, with Hawaii and how effective or whether it's appropriate or right, um, you know, if you want it to go away, give it a try. But do you, do you guys think that? I mean, maybe the uh, anti-smoking stuff is is almost more exaggerated. Is that ever crossed in your guys' mind? Well, I was I was going to ask the question: How many? What are the statistics in Hawaii? Are is there like a ton of people smoking? I, I could no, smoke I think well, I think what it is it's it's, it's the uh, hookah industry and the uh, the vaping. So because that they exempted that counts. vaping, huh? They exempted yeah. vaping. Did they exempt vaping? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, what's the so what is the most popular thing to smoke in Hawaii? That's what I'm thinking. Ganja? Like, is it even a real problem? Is it marijuana? 
Well, they didn't include marijuana either. Well, no, marijuana wouldn't be included. But, uh, you know, so, I mean, are you really going after the number one thing that's going to improve health for I everyone? I think it's really more of a, a social agenda. I think, and I hate to say it, as much as uh, everyone loves, what was it, the, uh, the truth.org or whatever, they, they have a little bit of a malevolent agenda to constantly push push this. Uh, they, they exaggerate a lot. Of, I don't know if you guys watched a lot of the, the, the commercials that they have. Uh, even some of the facts that they have are, are kind of skewed. Where they where they, they talked about one time where it was uh, how one uh, vape pod or whatever is equivalent to uh, twenty cigarettes. However, that's a misleading claim uh, because they're talking about the tobacco content. But the tobacco itself alone uh, is you can almost argue that it's it's medically bad bad for you in the same sense that caffeine is bad for you. It's more than just the tobacco. The tobacco it, it, you have to have the other chemicals that are in there. So it has the same amount of tobacco as 20 cigarettes, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has the same level of toxicity uh, as 20 Isn't cigarettes. Isn't the FDA right now considering or have already um, um, put in regulations to control the sale of vape? Yeah, and they were trying to ban uh, flavors. So they, they, they think right. that if they get rid of uh, cherry flavored or something like that, then kids won't will stop doing it. So law enforcement uh, associate, associates that I know tell me that their education about vaping right now, especially among youth and teenagers, is that it's epidemic already. Well, and it's epidemic that a lot of them are, are, are uh, using. I mean, that, that kid's been smoking pot way before the, uh, that stuff. So I, have, I have senior high school teachers uh, that uh, one in particular told me that um, the, a girl in her class will lean down, vape, and then blow the vape into her backpack, <laughs> which probably has happened with cigarettes and marijuana and other things. Uh, but, uh, you know, I see these vape stores popping up all over the place, and then you hear the backstories behind them, and I don't see people lining up to go in and buy them. Like, you know, uh, bu you know so, uh, you know, in the vape store that has a hundred bongs on the inside, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. but. They're, you know, the vape flavors, though, too, not only do they have vape flavors that may have more appeal for youth and, and children, but, but some of them they actually design to look like uh, uh, juice boxes with the colors and logos that mm -hmm. are similar. But you still have to be, uh, what was it, 21 in California to buy, to buy them. Uh, so regardless if, if, they're, uh, if they're being appealed to, I mean, you can't walk into those stores. Uh, you walk in there and you look like you're, you're a minor. You get carded. I mean, I know for a, for a while I've walked into stores in the past with friends, and they get carded everyone as soon as you walk in. Even if they don't, you, as soon as you make the purchase, you're, you're going to be Restricted carded. access doesn't prevent it, though. You know, so, so would you say, something has to step in. Okay, so if restricted access doesn't prevent it, so does should, should Hawaii <laughs> raise the uh, smoking age to 100? Well, that, is that going to reduce yeah, smoking? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I, they should just continue educating kids on yeah. the dangers of smoking. And, and, yeah. and I think over it's time, also it's also a parental responsibility. I don't know about you. I mean, I have kids, and I'm really clear with them about what's okay and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And what I found is, um, just as an anecdotal example, there's an enormous difference between the private school I had my kids in and the public school my son is now in. There are kids in seventh and eighth grade smoking in the bathrooms that would never fly at our at our private school. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in parenting, when how you make decisions, how you're educating your kids, and so I don't I don't rely on the government to solve my problems. So I wouldn't necessarily like say, oh please, you need to make this law, or you need to do this. I think we need to take responsibility for how we're raising our kids, like 100. percent And then as an aside to that care about our community and like what's going on in our community and educating that way too. That in, and, and it's trying to get communities to step up and do something about it. Yeah. Um, and use, I think existing laws. Um, but also, uh, you know, you're, I've, I've been told private or public that especially when you get into the high school kids, it's no different. I'm like sure the public in schools high school run it's with crazy. It. <laughs> but, but I have recently seen where in my community, uh, uh, elementary, mid, middle schools that are combined schools are having problems with vaping. Um, mm -hmm. And not necessarily chronic there, but this is also what they caught and saw. So what's happening behind the scenes they don't catch, who knows. Um, but not every parent's able to reach and connect with their kids. Um, like it sounds like you have with yours. 
and it doesn't make them bad parents, but they've told their kid to don't vote, don't vape, don't drink, don't do these things. But when they go to their high school and they go to use the bathroom and someone offers them vape with whatever substance may be in it or not, it's counter, it's counterintuitive to whatever work that parent has done. I think it's important to take personal responsibility for your community, for your family, for across the board. That will help immensely. As far as peer pressure, we know that's always been a huge issue. So what do your kids do when you go home at night? Are they, is everybody on their phone? You know, is everybody watching TV? Or are you like sitting down and having conversations? That's, that's a parenting style. At some point, the rubber meets the road and you have to be like, I'm actively involved and, and yes, they're individuals, they're gonna make their choices, but you do your best. And we're, the statistics we're seeing of the way that our children are coming out, we're not actively involved. Like a, a predominance of people are not actively involved in shaping how their children approach the world. And that's why you have millennials who wanna start businesses and still be socialists, but they don't wanna give away <laughs> their own money. You know what I mean? It doesn't make sense. But how do we get more people in a community? And this is a big issue for me to yeah. step up like you're saying. Because I feel, and, and, and not, you know, just, I, I feel I'm at least that average or better parent. My kids are young, uh, so it's still to be defined exactly how effective myself, my wife, or parenting style would be. Um, and I expect, based on what I see, um, it to so, be fine. But there's a lot of folks who it's not. Here, so, here's, a, here's a thought. What if we just uh, gave them tobacco-free vapes? <laughs> then you're just conditioning well, the them the, into the a habit. The vapes aren't safe themselves, <laughs> potentially. Yeah, you're you're still creating a habit. It's a it's a well, uh, and, oral and, habit. And let me let me take a more more unpopular approach. Um, what's the big deal if, if your kids start vaping? I mean, what uh, what 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 level of toxicity or damage do you think is going to happen? I'm generally against addiction in any form, so I wouldn't mm. recommend that, especially for children. Um, the other well, I'm not saying I'm not advocating children to to start vaping, but I'm well, just saying that like so, it's not. We I could just it, stuff a it vape with more. Oreo cookies. Well, and the other factor is there there are conditions that can arise from the that practice. Not that it's more harmful than smoking. I, I know that people like to argue about that. And then there's also like the slight chance that it will explode. That for me enough is. So you what know, about what about like like alcohol? Because uh, uh, here in America, I'm against children drinking too. Because <laughs> well, here in America, like what the drinking age is 21. My brother was living in Belgium for for a while with his girlfriend, and uh, I think the drinking age is like is like 12 or something like that over there. Mm. Uh, he was, I think he was uh, going to the clubs, uh, and there were like 16 year old At girls. 12? Yeah. Whoa. No, he wasn't 12. No, he wasn't 12, uh, but. He was under 21 and right. he was dr drinking over but there. But 12 year olds could go to clubs and drink in yeah. Belgium. Yeah, and, and even uh, I think England, which the drinking age is five. Well, you know that I don't look to the government for answers, right? Mm -hmm. But there's enough studies that show that if you're drinking before a certain age, it's affecting your brain development. So that for me is enough to be like, well, you know, I get it. We, we don't want well, you like and, and experimenting my, my, out in the world. So my, my point is not so much that, that, uh, that alcohol is good for you or, or not bad for you or anything like that, but rather uh, cult culturally. So over there, they don't really have a problem where, you're, where, where alcoholics, where kids start going and uh, binge drinking how we do in America. America. As soon as you turn 21, you drink a bunch and get drunk and get in the car. And uh, especially since Uber is too expensive now, uh, you end up getting in a car accident. Whereas over over there, it's that's not in the culture. The culture is is uh, it's socially accepted, and so there's no like peer pressure to start drinking anything. A lot of kids actually don't drink because there's, there's no because you don't make a big deal about it. It's not a big deal. Well, what about vaping though? And because we're talking about kids and older people and all that, what about <laughs> eighteen like to twenties? What about kids in college and millennials? Where do they see the vaping thing? I mean, is it really a thing, or is it just an internet buzz that we see? I think it's more of an. I think it's popular. It could be any more of an inter internet buzz. I mean, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm more on the high side of my twenties, but most people my age kind of look kind of look down to other people who vape. So it's kind of. Uh, I I think it's just more of just a culture thing, uh, and and really the. I think, I think the best way to really solve it is cool. Do you search on Amazon for like all these different vape opportunities and that you can order? And I have no idea. Put them in your cart and decide later if you're going to buy them. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. know. 
I don't know. I don't, I don't partake, but I think that we have to find a barometer other than laws that people are going to ignore. Um, as far as the cultural differences, I don't know that that's a direct correlation. I think, like I said before, we need more personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you had a cool-headed teen that turn, you know, they turned 21 and they wanted to go out with their friends, it doesn't mean that they're going to get wasted. Mm -hmm. If they get wasted and they drive drunk and they crash and they cause you know harm, that was a personal choice. Yeah. So you could have uh, more responsibility and still be reasonable when you're talking to your kids about like this is going to have long term damaging effects on you. Well, in the addiction piece, some people say that the vaping is now the gateway drug, as they said. Cigarettes were a gateway drug to all these other things, and maybe it's only twenty percent of those who use it. I think it, it was those candies that I used to smoke when I was that the lucky <laughs> candies. That, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Um, the uh, but but seriously though, the uh, because one of the things that uh, the the vape device that has the harmless liquid in it, some of them can do is they have the uh, hash oil that mm -hmm. is very dangerous, um, and the potency levels of cannabis are 500 percent more today than they what were mm -hmm. years ago well speaking of cannabis i mean what, now that in uh, california and a lot of other states that it's become legal but they still have a really really high tax on it so it's still actually not being safe because it's still being sold in the black market what are you guys thoughts on how the black market has still barely been affected since they legalized it mainly because of taxes i mean sh sh was keeping having really high taxes on cannabis a good way to legalize it nope I actually, um, when I was running for office, I met with business owners in Sacramento who mm -hmm. had growth facilities and also people who processed um, into different products. And one of the things that was brought to my attention was it was legalized and you could do your business there, but as soon as uh, 2019 hit, you were getting taxed like five different ways depending on your process. Mm -hmm. And it was taking the revenue almost completely. It was really affecting the distribution portion. And they also limited almost like a taxi coin, how many people could uh, mm -hmm. deliver in the Sacramento region. It went from like hundreds of people who were delivering to like five or something crazy like that. And so what happened is as soon as those regulations hit, the people that I had met with here picked up all their operations and left. So all of that tax revenue that we were getting mm -hmm. is now gone yep. because they tried to get too much. And so people are still, people are still smoking it, it, but now it's black market weed. It's all black <laughs> market, right? And then they're going to reduce those taxes for three years to get people to come back. Only three years. To only. build. Yeah, <laughs> only three years. Only. Yep. El Dorado County just passed uh, commercial growing. And it was interesting because it's always, uh, you know, there's a formatted, uh, formatted commentary that leads you to make a decision one way or another. And then after the fact, you hear all these other things. And the term that I heard up there was um, uh, cannabis tourism. Hmm. Almost kind of like wine tasting? I, oh. I can't. Well, I don't actually kind of fun. I, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't smoke weed, but I, no, I, I, I would, yeah. I would <laughs> want to I mean, go on a tour for that. Yeah. <laughs> None of us, well, I don't smoke either, but I'm. I think that if you have the entrepreneurial spirit, you're going to try and build a business, right? And this was such an exciting thing for it to become legalized in California because all of these people have these ideas and they want to do these things and build. And, you mm -hmm. know, if you're logical, you would say, okay, well, we've legalized it. Now let's tax a reasonable portion of it so that they will do business here and so it won't be underground. Because the second you drive it underground, all your tax revenue is gone. Yep, and then you have very uh, you have unsafe you know growing measures. People you don't know what's going on when it when it's black black market. It's not where when it's leaseism is legalized. We can kind of make sure it's more exposed. We know that how it's how it's cultivated, and we know that uh, fertilizer EPA. Yeah, you have all those other regulations involved. But now there's that, less that, uh, other crimes associated too. Exactly, all that's going away now. Yeah, this isn't even be oh, like a partisan issue anymore. I read uh, I forget exactly where I read it, mm -hmm. but there were Democratic and Republican politicians and legislatures that were talking openly about decreasing the excise tax from 15 to, I think, 11%. Mm -hmm. 
I thought it was a pretty good idea. I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to, going to encourage cannabis business here. I agree. I, mean, I, think, I think the Republicans definitely dr- jumped on board, uh, at least a large portion of them, maybe not all of them. Uh, and there's still a lot of Democrats that are still on the other side who want to stop weed from being legalized, but it's definitely become more of a un- nonpartisan issue. Did you no- guys notice when Trump sort of very quietly legalized hemp? Yeah, I no was going to bring that up. Oh, He's, well, it, it was, was it's out there. It's, it was like it's out there in the 21st? national news. Yeah, yeah. For but legalized hemp for uh, commercial applications and using it for what clothing, ropes, and anything mm-hmm. else that hemp could be used for. Uh, it's like a trillion was, dollar industry. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it, and, and it's and what it's going to do is um, uh, some of the segments I think of of marketplace that we had lost, i.e., uh, you know, cotton and materials mm-hmm. being um, produced uh, overseas. Maybe more farmers can turn to hemp here, mm-hmm. put it in their rotations, and then we use those materials to, uh, in a productive manner through manufacturing in yeah. the U.S. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. Well, speaking of Republicans, um, what are you guys' thoughts with uh, <laughs> our, our former, former the Libertarian, former VP candidate, Bill Weld, uh, leaving the Libertarian Party and going back to the Republicans, probably where he belongs, uh, back to the Republican <laughs> Party. What are your thoughts, Alex? <laughs> Well, what's, what's the Yale perspective from that? <laughs> I, I can't speak for Yale National, but I can speak for myself. Um, I read that he was con- he did this because he was considering running a primary challenge against Trump. I mm-hmm. don't think it's going to work. Trump's too popular with the Republican base right now. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, well, he wasn't. Well, Bill Weld certainly wasn't very popular with the Libertarians when he was with us. So <laughs> no, indeed. Well, everyone's like, oh. Libertarians were mean to Bill, so he left. And that is not the case. He's very strategic in his thinking. He has a team around him of great people who are trying to figure out how to make an effective run for president. Mm -hmm. Okay? I have no attachment to Bill. I'm not like I own him now because he became a libertarian, so now he has to do whatever I say. (laughs) Uh, Frankly, I think that that's very short-sighted. But I did call an East Coast counterpart because I wanted to know exactly what the heck he was up to. And I found out that, like you said, if he runs in the primary, I think it's in New Hampshire, and he's successful in getting a big, you know, a chunk of the base that Trump is supposed to get, it Mm -hmm. can weaken Trump as a candidate and end up uh, being the turning point for him not going on for a second term. So that's the idea behind that. And he's heavily... uh, incentivized to do that because there are people in the Republican Party who want to pay for this because they want a different candidate in. Yeah, I mean, Bill Willis certainly is good at fundraising. Even when he was with us, he was certainly did bring a lot of money towards the Gary Johnson campaign. Isn't that what a lot of people that are Republicans don't like about libertarians is that they uh, uh, railroad the Republican ticket, i.e. Oh, every time uh, there's an upset. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a it's a good old <laughs> conversation yeah, this constant thing. Like, you vote, if you vote for but, the, them, you vote for the other guy. But so. Weld, told Weld me that was I a, single-handedly got Trump elected because I voted for Gary and I advocated for Gary. I'm like, all right, that's guys. So well, <laughs> yeah, that's a but, I mean, I'm watching Libertarian Counterpoint. We'll see you guys next week. Um,